Okay. Uh, uh, we're going to get going because we were slightly late starting. So I'm going to say welcome to our first uh, first Friday for this year. So, um, here, yeah, I can't believe it's already February, but, but there you go. I hope everybody is well and staying well and um, you're yeah, having a good time. I just want to very briefly and very quickly introduce uh, some of you, many of you already know Minu, um, but she has now uh, formally joined uh, Art Dot Earth as our assistant director. So she's already busy uh, kind of um, um, doing all kinds of things for us and, and uh, uh, getting the next uh, uh, symposium sorted. So, uh, um, Minu, I've just spotlighted you. If you want to, uh, just say uh, say a quick hello to everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, really happy to step into um, big shoes that I'm still learning how to fit properly, and um, uh, working a lot in our next symposium. Uh, but also on some other things coming up this year. And I'm just really, um, really happy to be joining this community a little bit more and um, really looking forward to today's presentations. Great. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks, Minnie. Um I'm going to uh, just say, remind everyone, please, to uh, stay muted when you're not uh, when you're not actually talking, but when you are talking, try and remember to unmute yourself. Um, uh, and also do use the chat. So the chat's a great way to kind of extend the conversation. And, you know, if you want people to get be able to get in touch with you, you know, do share your email, bearing in mind it is a, a public forum. Um, only, it will only be seen by the people here. Uh, and uh, finally, we are recording. So as always, we will uh, post this video up on the website as very soon. So usually within about 24 hours, but unless something goes wrong and that takes a bit longer. So I'm going to hand over to Jude Allen, um, who is uh, a long time art.earth person and has worked with us on a number of things. Uh, and I'm going to uh, turn over to you, Jude. Um, yeah, okay, so I'm just going to share my screen a minute. I might be a bit technically inept here. Can you all see that? We can. Um, the chat's gone. Good. Okay, great stuff. Um, so, yeah, it's um, it kind of feels a bit weird being here. So I'm just going to talk to you about the project, and it's not really what I describe as sort of art with a capital A, so I feel like a bit of an imposter. But anyway, here you go. Um so I'm just going to give you an account of, of the project and, and where it's going because it's sort of arty-ish. Um, okay, so um, Soil Voices um, has been um, kind of, we, we kind of set it up. So I'm going to talk about the, the project and then think about what Soily Voices are um, and finish with an invitation for you to add your own Soil Voice. Okay, so basically my kind of background is in literature um, and I've always done gardening, but got really obsessed with soil when I moved to Devon and where I lived before I had this really amazing allotment and then moved to Devon and ended up with a particularly bad bit of soil um, to grow my vegetable vegetables in. And I decided the soil had lost its narrative um, while I was digging away at it. Um, completely dead. There were no creatures in it. It had been sprayed for years. Um, and as a result, I ended up kind of doing lots of research on, on soil and story. And then, um, like, oh, this sort of went on for a few years and ended up in conversation with the British Society of Soil Science, um, who are, they've got a massive international conference um, in Glasgow this year um, coming up. And what they wanted to do was have some sort of um, output for the conference in which scientists could communicate kind of quite dull ideas um, to people who are not interested in science or soil. 
and so um when i applied for funding they gave me some funding and i got um just a little bit to seed funding and it was kind of how humanities can communicate the the sort of plight of the soil to people who are not normally interested in it um and the fact that you know soil is is a really really important thing but we're just losing it rapidly through um contamination kind of overuse of pesticides um erosion it's being plowed up washed away blown away or it's being covered over and sealed in by urban development so that's a bit of a boring thing that's gone um so kind of back to the idea that this dead soil and my veg plot had completely lost its story or if it hadn't been lost it was um very impoverished and a very sad story of neglect and abuse so i thought that at the same time that this story had lost its soil we'd also lost stories that connect us to soil and if we don't have those stories then we kind of don't speak about it and we don't even think about it and very similar to sort of like robin farlane's lost words ideas if we lack those stories or the language to speak about it then it kind of ceases to exist in our imagination um i'll talk a bit closer i don't know how to turn my volume up is that better yeah it was fine anyway for me so oh okay um, okay good but um, maybe, maybe uh speak speak, speak yeah, loudly yeah. shove my face into the laptop um so so we've kind of lost this sort of means of speaking about soil and then it kind of ceases to exist in the way that we think about the world particularly if we're not kind of connected to it so I've been kind of going around and, and collecting stories and asking people to tell us their stories about farming and gardening, um, childhood memories, and also thinking about emotional responses to soil. Um, so we also got another bit of funding. Um, oh yeah, the other woman in the project, I forgot about her. <laughs> so Isla is a, a playwright in Scotland and she was sort of the other half of the Soil Voices project. And she's been doing um, a kind of oral, uh, a radio audio drama um, and that's her kind of bit um, and then we also got some stimulus funding from the international union of soil science is to do some creative workshops with schools We've been doing lots of work with kids um, and the first one was just fantastic we got a school in kenya um, and Cherston, which is in devon Cherston school um, and we got these kids to work for six weeks um writing about soil and their responses to it and really kind of thinking about i suppose um thinking about their connection to soil and also to pay some attention to it and then do some various creative responses um and you can kind of have a look we're looking at sort of because my background's in english it was sort of a lot of you know adjectives and, and just similes and that kind of thing and we got them to write letters to the soil and then we culminated the end of that workshop in um we we got all the kids to um to pretend that they were soil animals and we set up a scenario did a couple um and one of them was when they had too much rain for months and months and months um and the kids kind of wrote a script for a play which i'll play for you in a minute um ideally they would have it would have been their voices but we couldn't kind of work out the tech with kenya and their sort of very limited tech access to technology and and get it right so we got somebody to to voice it over for us now i'm going to try and juggle sharing screen now um so bear with me and i'll share the youtube video um okay so share new screen Grammar School, Devon, read by James Rotker. Here in our field, it has been raining every day for six long weeks. The ground is very wet. Some of the soil has even washed away. Under a fallen branch, two little woodlice stand shivering. I'm so cold, said one. <laughs> Freezing, said the other. The water isn't draining away properly. Where are the worms? 
They need to wriggle around and make holes for the water to drain through. One little worm pokes its head up. We're finding it hard to cope. We don't feel well. Our food's getting washed away, it cries. Oh, I wish it were a bit warmer, <laughs> sobs a rotifer. Yes, says another. I'm worried and hungry. Meanwhile, a little way away, the springtails are arguing. I don't like all this rain, but I can't get inside, said one. Yes, I'm cold and wet, said another. I don't know what you're talking about, said the third, bouncing around. I personally love the wet. I'm scared of being too dry. <laughs> yes, said a tardigrade. I think it will be okay, even if it is more difficult to move because of the water bodies larger than me. Ah, well, tardigrades are tough. After all, they can survive on the moon. If only it were that easy for everyone. I'm happy, said a mole. I'm keeping warm under the soil. But I am worried that my tunnel might get flooded. Yes, exactly, mole. Even if we're happy, we're going to have to work together to keep us all safe. The mycorrhizal stir themselves into life. We need to tell the plants, they cry. Don't worry, plants, we'll keep you warm. This feels annoying, the plant roots cry back. Some of my roots are too thin, they might get washed away. Don't worry, I feel fine, I'm ready to work, said a chorus of worms. The soil is easier to dig when it's wet said a mole. And just for today, we'll leave you worms alone so that you can do your job. And so, holes were wriggled and dug, and the water was able to drain away, and in time, the rain stopped, and the sun came out again. But all the little soil creatures knew they'd have to be ready to work together again when the next problem came along. Right, there we go. So that was a 12 year old's, um, I'm being mauled trying to find my way out. A 12 year old or a bunch of 12 year olds response to, um, to some of the, the soil issues. So let me just share my screen back again. So, so as well as doing kind of workshops um, with kids, we've done some stuff with adults as well. And we've done various kind of participation events where we've invited people to kind of um, send us their, their soil stories and just thinking about um, what their relationship is to soil. Um, because I think if the way I was thinking yesterday actually about compacted thinking and the way the soil has been compacted, I was, I was kind of my argument would be that the way that we're thinking about soil has become compacted and if that's compacted where is the space for story and I'm really interested in kind of opening up the soil and ideas and thinking about how we can um, kind of open, like sort of re re-establish memories and so the whole soul, soil starts to hold these stories in the way that um, we can hold stories for the soil as well. And so this is just sort of, I'm just kind of aware of time because I want to listen to some more stories. So this was a, um, something that we did for um, solstice, which we called soilstice. And we made lots of kind of earth goddesses out of mud and with various degrees of success. Um, yeah, this is something as well that, um, sorry, this is a bit pitted and, and rushed, but <laughs> I just wanted to give you a kind of general idea. So this is a quote from Robert McFarlane um, in Underland, and he says, um, the same three tasks recur across cultures and epochs, to shelter what is precious, to yield what is valuable, and to dispose of what is harmful. Shelter, memories, precious matter, messages, fragile lives, yield, information, wealth, metaphors, minerals, and visions, and dispose, waste, trauma, poison, and secrets. Into the underland, we have long faced that which we fear, 
and wish to lose and that which we love and wish to save. So soil has this kind of really kind of strange thing in that it holds everything um, that we ever were and it holds our bodies and the death and the decay, but also holds life. And I think it kind of, in that way, it kind of functions as abject in a way because it's uncategorizable. Um, and I've just done um, a presentation about a whole load of stuff about soil and gut health and how how our gut um, becomes sort of abject as well in the way that what we kind of consume is like both in us but also goes out of us so it's sort of part of us and not part of us and the way that we think about um, soil and the connection to gut is something that we sort of push away from us in the same way that we push death away. Um, so this is all a bit over the place. There's a really lovely thing that I want you to listen to. Um, this, which is a soil scientist who is talking about his father's burial in the soil. So I'm just going to quickly whiz back and stop share and then. It's just beautiful, I think. That's a bit of a character, I guess. And when he died, it wasn't unexpected. He was, you know, he's, he's 80 and he had a, minor, a major stroke. So, was, yeah, it was very, very sad, but uh, his time had come. So uh, as, as a son of the of the family, I uh, stand at the head of the, the gravestone, the, of the grave, um, and luring him into the the hole, the, or the, what it's called, the hole for, for the coffin, I just suddenly thought, what a superb soil to find, end your days in. I really did. And I thought, God, what's dad going to think about that? But I thought, well, he just laugh. He, he really will just laugh. It was a very warm, fully drained brown soil, which it sort of invited you to stay there almost. And I thought, yeah, he'll be, he'll be happy there. He'll be happy there. Um, not a, bad, not a bad place to finish his, his days, I think. So that's somebody else's um, soil story and quite a different kind of perspective than that of the the kids, clearly. Um, right, what do we need? PowerPoint. Okay, so um, where are we going from here? Oh, 15 minutes is not very long. So we kind no, of sort of... You've got four minutes, Jude. Four, four minutes, half, okay. Four right, I'm just going to just pick you through it. So I'm just kind of, it's about, the whole project is about thinking what we've lost and we've interviewed sort of various people including Guy Watson, who's um, kind of lamenting and talking about his emotional response to watching soil be destroyed. Um, people about growing their father, grandfather's growing tobacco. Um, and you can see all this um, if you have a look at the, our YouTube site, which I'll put in for you later. And also there's like the literal memories. So thinking about Seamus Heaney's bog bodies, for example, which I think are horrific, except it, and also incredibly beautiful and how the the soil you know the soil holds traces of everything like it might hold immediate traces of our footprints or the the chemicals that have been sprayed on it or the the sparrow that died yesterday but it also holds this massive idea of history and that Heaney talks about this a lot in his poetry with the idea of palimpsest and digging through things that becomes um metaphorical um but, 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 but four minutes so this is from Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. It's not just land that is broken, but more importantly, our relationship to land. We can't meaningfully proceed with healing, with restoration, without restoriation. In other words, our relationship with land cannot heal until we hear its stories, but who will tell them? And we're kind of hoping the project is, is going to kind of do that. So thinking about the language that people use of soil. We've been looking at that a lot. You know, it's soiled or, you know, it's seen as dirt. Often soil is described as dirt. Um, you know, get that muddy football boot out of here, I find myself saying sometimes. Um, we've also done lots of kind of, um, this is Instagram. So we're trying to write from the perspective of soil and we were getting the kids to do that as well. You know, what if the soil had a voice? So if you go to our Instagram, you can see lots of little, soil stories um where um trying to just rethink how, how we listen to um not only other creatures but inanimate 
um, things as well. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff. Again, go and have a look on YouTube. That's a whole Mother Earth thing we did for Mother's Day. Um, this is some stuff we've got some kids to write. So I'm going to kind of conclude with asking you, um, if you feel like it, um, to give you an invitation um, to write a story about the soil um, or a story written by the soil, letter to the soil, you know, kind of anything. And I'm not really asking for war and peace. It can be just a little snippet. And if you have a look on the, let's see, oh yeah, Mr. Bean's soil poem, which is an actual thing. <laughs> this poem is never boil soil, which may be a bit simplistic, but to show you, it doesn't have to be like really um, huge. So we've got this Soil Voices website and this is a map. And if you go to the map and click on all these little things, um, we've got about 60 or 70 there now. There's little video clips that people have recorded, but also just PDFs of, of responses to soil. Some people have written poems. It's just, it's just we're trying to build up this kind of overall map. And then we're going to go to Waitrose or somewhere and go, look, people are really interested in soil. Make Pay some attention to it, but we're not quite sure how to do that, that kind of jumping into supermarkets bit, but that's the eventual aim. So anyway, I hope that wasn't too kind of potted and all over the place and um, that you enjoyed it. And thank you so much for having me. So thank you. Thanks, Jude. Um, uh, it was fine. It was enough of a, you gave enough of a sense to um, kind of really get a sense of the project. Uh, I am not at all sure about um, uh, art with a, without a capital A. I think there's plenty of art in there. Uh, some fabulous words. Uh, um, we, we need to make sure that we share the link for the Soil Voices website. So if you can pop that into the chat again, maybe if you haven't done it already. And um, I'm sure, quite sure you'll get some contributions from this lovely group. So great. Um, but I am going to uh, move on. Um, and I'm going to move on to Natasha. So I'm going to bring uh, Natasha in and say goodbye to Jude. Um, and, and Natasha, um, I'm very intrigued by those, by those what look like portholes behind you, but I'm sure they're not portholes, but um, maybe you can um, tell us what they are. Well, it's, it's really appropriate to be following Jude because I'm actually living in an earth house, which is made with um, earth from my, uh, from the land that I'm on. And um, one of the things that uh, we did when um, building this earth house, it's a super adobe house uh, from Nahil Khalil um, in the States, I'm in the States. And there was actually a sort of um, a veto against using the word dirt. Yeah. <laughs> it was found to be derogatory. And um, there was the reminder to constantly use the word earth to sort of make that connection with uh, the fact that the soil and the earth are our home and our mother. Americans tend to use that word dirt too, don't they? A lot, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So um, I'm a drum maker and I'm also a herbalist. And uh, strangely enough, these two things um, sort of met uh, uh, with making drums. Uh, I uh, have a drum uh, here and um, it's it's not painted. I, I'm going to talk later about um how I paint the drums and that's where the art part comes in, but also making drums is an art as well. But I'm gonna just pay, play um, play for a minute or two um, uh, my drum and it'll be great because it'll settle me and um, settle everyone else. So if we can all uh, just feel ourselves in our body and move move into our into our bodies feeling feeling the earth beneath our feet
So the drum that I was playing on is um, the most simple drum that we have. It's a frame drum and every culture around the world has their version of this very simple drum, which is um, just a piece of wood with an animal skin stretched over it and laced at the back. And um, the reason why we all have these drums and the reason why they're very, very old is because um, a drum is basically one of our most basic forms of prayer and one of the most basic ways that we connect with the heartbeat of the earth and connect with the sky and align ourselves into that magical pulse between the earth and the sky that, that we can also feel with our own heartbeat. And of course, the drum is um, very reminiscent of a heartbeat. Uh, you cannot get too complicated while playing a frame drum. Um, you know, uh, unlike a uh, djembe, um, of course, the Irish do really great with the double double sided stick um, with the budrin drums. And so, but basically, a frame drum is a very very simple drum to play. In that, it's just um, banging it uh, with with the stick, and usually it's it's just that um, pretty simple beat as you heard as you heard there. So I'm going to share my screen and you can see um, where this is going with um, some of my art. Now, one of the reasons why, oops, it's not meant to do that. One of the reasons why I um, started doing drums is because I do a lot of journey work um, in my healing work with plants. And journey work is when we use something like a drum beat or a rattle to um, go into a trance, a meditative state, and go to the higher higher plane or the lower plane. We go to other other realms. And for me, art has always been a way to access a liminal realm and a liminal space. And um, I'm, I'm sure we'll all resonate um, knowing <clears throat> how when we're in the middle of our art, time ceases to have meaning and we really travel somewhere. And when we um, feel really successful with our art, or at least I'm speaking from my own personal experience, it's almost like we're not there, we're not present, we're simply channeling divine inspiration and managing to, um, you know, uh, express it in whatever form that takes, whether it be a basket or painting or all the myriad aspects we have of expressing our creativity. And so it was really wonderful to sort of combine all of these things together and to also work for um, other people. So I do do some drums just out of the desire to make uh, drums for, for, my, for my own artistic inspiration. But a lot of the drums I do, I do for people specifically for their own journey work and for their own connection to prayer and also for a way for them to explore the power of this work when we're using drums and prayer and meditation to sort of connect into something that is greater than ourselves. Um, as you can see, there's all kinds of different ways of lacing in the back. Just wanted to show you that. And um, this drum is a drum that I did for myself. It's a theme around um, promise and Beltane. So I'm really personally influenced a lot 
by my work with the plants. I've been a herbalist for about 12 years and I use mostly local medicine. And a lot of the information traditional herbalists um, get is actually by sitting with the plants themselves and having a direct conversation with the plants. And traditional herbalism, whether it's Ayurvedic or Chinese or Western, um, has been informed by what the plants have told us. And when you start going into these sort of um, uh, more uh, uh, alternative realms of thinking, which is plant communication and also other world communication, communicating with spirits, say, um, you know, apart from uh, feeling slightly crazy, uh, you, you really get this incredible sense of being able to be connected into something that is greater than yourself and um, quite often you receive uh, deep somatic healing, which is basically bypassing our wonderful but really busy minds and really being able to re reach into the heart space of um, where we are and, and who we are and, and feeling into our sensations and trusting in our sensations in our body and feeling feeling the healing from that. Um, I will I will leave some time for some questions. I think so. I don't I can't see my clock, Richard, because of the screen. But if you could stop me a couple of minutes before that would yeah, be great. sure, no problem. Because um, mainly I've just got some pictures of the drums. So the drum skin I will soak for a couple of hours. Um, in my earth house, I have an outside bathtub, which is also my drum soaking place. Um, and I will pay attention to the moon. It's part of my work as a healer. And I'll also often put flower essences. This one's got some rose petals and often rocks will want to go in there and things will call to me. So with this work and I think with a lot of artistic work, there's a lot of um, subliminal messages and mainly my job is to pay attention to what's calling to me. Um, and that's where it becomes a practice because plant, um, human communication, um, journey work, all of this is, you know, is, is sort of, um, it's, it's not direct or clear like like language is. It's, it's something that you have to feel and listen out for. And it can be confusing. Often your head can come get in the way. You know, you can like, am I making this up? You know, so having this as a practice is really helpful. And the more you practice, the uh, the more you become attuned to to what's calling to you and what to do. And so I get my skins from a local place, uh, which has um, really good connection with the hunters in this area. I, I'm lucky in that I live in a pretty wild place above Seattle here in the States. And um, I, chew, I, I have a choice of horse or elk or bison or um, goat and bear and um, deer and sometimes moose. So you can see quite a lot of varied animal skins that we get to choose from. And when I work with people, that's often quite important because all the skins have their own energies as well. Um, uh, cow, I forgot, we, I'm working on a cow drum right now. And oops, I also get a lot of inspiration from my work with the plants. So a lot of my drums end up being either with plants or animal archetypes. Um, and there's also sacred geometry that wants to come in. So with this drum, my idea for the person that I was working with was completely different from what ended up. And I actually ended up making a drum based a lot on my impressions and it was awful. The drum rattled, the picture looked horrible and I worked and worked with it. And then I finally just, um, 
gave up and started afresh and did a journey to the drum. And this is what I'll frequently do is I'll journey to the spirit of the drum. For me, drums have their own spirit and they have their own voice. And it's really important to honor this work. Um, I am, I'm lucky in that I've studied with a teacher for many years about how to do journey work safely. Um, obviously, when you're entering into different realms, you want to make sure that you're properly boundaried and um, you know, it's it's good to have a teacher to guide you in this work. And I felt very fortunate in that I have one. So I did a journey to the spirit of this drum. And my idea for this person was all about ravens. And we we were both really in love with ravens and, and what they meant. And, and that's the picture that completely failed. And so when I did a journey to the spirit of the drum, um, the, the spirit of Ra came up, uh, the Egyptian god, which, you know, was very unexpected for me. Um, I don't really have a connection with that, with that archetype um, or entity. And he said, I am sunshine, I give all life. And um, so, uh, which was actually so appropriate for the person that this drum was for and the work that they do. Um, so the metatahedron came up and the beautiful pond lily, which is um, a plant that we use medicinally very much about taking all the murkiness and swampiness um, of life and creating this beautiful flower that then, um, you know, is very splendid. So you've got that medicine of the darkness to, to the light. And that is one of the ways that I use pond lily in my um, herbal practice. And uh, that's the way we went with this drum here. Just, uh, just under four minutes, Natasha. All right. So some people have their own visions and they're really precise down to the drool. Um, here, I got this complete instruction from this person and I just do my best to render it. And luckily I had some in life models to work from as well. Um, and then this again was a very clear vision from somebody. And then some people just let me go for it. So I just, you know, start working away and come up with what what I sense and usually what the journey tells me, which can be quite surprising. This was again from another journey. And, you know, I was just remember doing this piece of art going, gosh, I really hope this person doesn't mind having a dead bird on their drum. Um, but then again, that is very much a symbol of resurrection and uh, it was very meaningful to the person it was for. And then this was, uh, for a couple who were getting married. And I think they're probably going to get pregnant because this is, Trillium is what showed up, which is the uh, flower of creativity and fertility. So <laughs> I didn't tell them that because I uh, <laughs> just gave them the drum, but I was like, whoa. <laughs> um, and it's a real honor and the work is always surprising and delightful. And yeah, if anyone has questions. Um, uh, can we kind of, if you want to ask a question, feel free to just uh, um, uh, on, uh, to, to uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. I'd like to ask a question, if that's okay. Um, it's really interesting when you were saying you were using different animals, um, the skins of different animals had different kind of feelings. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that. Um, so, for example, a deer is, um, you yeah, know, it's, you, you, again, it's very similar to the work with plants. You sort of really just observe what what the animal is and what it's doing can you, so can, it, you un, yeah. can, you, can you unshare so we can see you again oh time. absolutely um there we go there we go okay, so a uh, deer is you know um got that heightened sensitivity um and it's 
it's got an, an, a nervousness about it, which sort of gives it that heightened sensitivity. And um, it's not the most grounded animal. Is that reflected um, in the material? So when you're making the drum, would you be more sent? Would it be more responsive, for example, in the actual no, the, fabric of it? The skins it are just the skins are skins. I mean, a bison is generally a thicker skin and more difficult to work with in that sense. But um, one of my favorite drums, actually, and this is quite hard for a lot of people, is horse skin. Um, uh, because horses, if you imagine, you know, they, they're so good for calling in. So there's this aspect with drum work as well. You're often using a drum to call something in, and you can also be using a drum to ground, and you can also be using a drum to, um, you know, uh, take something away. So drums are often associated with opening and closing. So I'll definitely work closely with the client to ask what their intention is and then what kind of um, animal resonates with them. Are they, are they, um, do they have that, do they want that power of the horse? Really great power. And the first drum I showed you was a horse skin. It's also that really beautiful dark brown. Or do they want that more, a tuneness of the deer or the stability of the cow and the bison and the elk. So yeah, do, the animal skin makes a difference. Do you, do you ever get asked to, to make a drum as, as a memorial out of a skin of an animal who's been in someone's life? Not yet, but I have worked with people's own drums um, right. as well as making, making mine from scratch and then painting them. And, um, oh, yeah, I use an acrylic ink, which also they do those beautiful shimmers now. Yeah. So I get to put gold and silver, which I love. And I can't photograph. So that's frustrating. <laughs> Fantastic. It, it shimmers in the firelight. So that, that really, really uh, works. Uh, very quick question from Jackie, and then we'll move on. She, she says, uh, is, there, is there an alternative to... to to animal skin that obviously there is with drums but would do do you always use animal skin yeah i do use animal skins and i um would love it if i was the one who was um embracing the animal at that time at the moment of death um i'm uh you know i i understand the relationship between the materials that you're working with <clears throat> so I was I am really selective in the and that the company that I work for, this local company works with, with the first peoples um, of our area <clears throat> and the hunters and um, the the it's the animals don't come from, uh, you know, the animals are all um, killed uh, and they're yeah, they're killed in 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 this area and it's local skin and it's done in a sustainable manner as far as it's from hunters and the first people so um it's it's always good to be hands-on but unfortunately that's the best i can do for yeah. now yeah uh, i'm i'm sure we could go on with this conversation but thank you and uh, i'm going to uh quite quickly move us on to uh, Gaia, so that we uh, Gaia has plenty of time to to uh, share her presentation. Thank you, Richard. Um, I think um, I'll just get my screen up, but I think it's absolutely fascinating that the um, three of us have been brought um, together today because I too have a connection with the Earth and drums and herbs and trees and make essences and work with sacred geometry. So um, I find that very interesting. <laughs> right, okay, can everybody see my screen? We can, there's a funny little uh, uh, kind of uh, oblong at the bottom, but uh, I think if you play it, it'll probably mm -hmm. be fine. I've gone back, right, okay. So, okay, um, I'll be presenting about two distinctive but overlapping projects. 
which have emerged from Rewilding the Artist, which is an Arts Council Wales funded research and development project. Um, the two projects are Earth Song, which is an embodiment of myself, and Cathedral of the Trees, which is the embodiment of social and environmental change. A um, little bit about me. Um, as you know, my name's Gaia. I'm a disabled and neurodivergent visual artist, facilitator and neurodiversity and arts consultant. And I live and work in West Wales. I graduated from BCU um, with a degree in fine art in 2012 and moved to Pembrokeshire in 2018. And I'm currently an associate artist with Oriel Davies in Powys. My work is auto-ethnographical and performative and has a deep connection to space and place through sense and experience and how that impacts my health and well-being. So to tell you a little bit about Rewilding the Artist first, uh, Rewilding the Artist is a seven month project, currently halfway through the project, and it explores how autistic or neurodivergent sensory practice can become the basis of an arts practice to facilitate and support physical and mental well-being. So rather than two distinct activities, they become one integrated practice. The project is largely focused on liminality. I call it Ma. Um, my sensory response to space, place and object and the development of 5D mapping to document that experience. The project also includes an experiential process and reflection to develop not only the support I need but also informing how to support others through a similar journey of finding and al aligning with what is truly embedded in somebody's soul through their practice. Rewilding is a pilgrimage of many directions, twists and turns, unknown outcomes, a process of exploring the liminal between reality and truth and potential fiction or imparted by other and it's revealing the two distinct but intertwining directions and long-term projects of Earth Song and Cathedral of the Trees. But first of all, we'll look at some of the sensory response. Um, the image is um, simply my starting map at the um, beginning of the project to aid my direction. So, um, multisensory mapping of Hrithet. Hrithet is a farmhouse dairy built in 1890, which is also my home. Hrithet translates from the Welsh into English as freedom. I've got a strong connection with the past and present um, through the energy of the house. I've been researching aspects of its history, people and physical changes or manifestation. I began the mapping by sitting for a period of time in each space, deep listening. I noticed the house, its contents, the wider space and how it inhabits the land and myself and the other inhabitants. I recorded um, sounds in words and digital sound clips. The sense of smell also came into place and found its place in, into the words. Stories and voices of the past have been um, documented via images, conversations and deep dreaming. And this works ongoing. And this is just a simple sample of a little bit of the writing from the deep listening. So wood burners gently roar, clock ticking, not here. Faint sound of typing, cat's paws, cat's claws on a wooden floor. Meow, jump. Shopping bag relaxing, moving of wood. And the creaking of floorboards. Cold draft on my face from the stairs and cars going into the village. 
Oh, birds' feet. Crackle of fire. Feels like dry cotton. Chimney drawing. Cat's purr. Faint sound of husband clipping nails. Pencil on paper. Another sensory response that I've been working on um, is, and people often think this is quite bizarre, but this is my neurodivergent um, experience of life and synesthetic experience of life. An aspect of my work is working with Oriel Davies, um, a gallery in Powys, to create sensory responses to their physical space. The project has, as the project has developed, I've realized what I was actually doing was mapping myself by creating a fully sensory experience that recreated the experience of the original space, then documented it. And in this case, in digital form. The original space um, that I was responding to was, wait for it, a purple floor laid in the accessible toilet that elicits feelings of excitement and being able to breathe for the first time and a deep, deep sense of freedom. Now, my response to the floor bears absolutely no relation to the artwork in the gallery. The artwork is amazing, but my sense response, response was just off the scale. It was fantastic. We um, recreated this on a very cold and windy day on the beach. For me, these two parallels were almost identical in response. This work has now made its way into rewilding the artist and into Earth Song. Spirit of place. So this image is a sense response to the land, in this case, Amroth Beach in South Pembrokeshire. It was an experimental collaborative performance with Zen Redgrave. Zen expressed the spirit of place with the drum, and flute, I with movement and words. Without discussion, we both express the nature of a wild seabird in flight. There is something very special about collaborating with the land and spirits of place within the liminal. A sense of the bigger picture emerges and our place in the world and cycles of life. Imagined boundaries of human hierarchical concepts are removed and we're all one. And finally, sensory response and communication. I work with the land, particularly trees, through the mar or the liminal, the liminal space where communication and sensory exchange can happen. The space in between all things. At times, I facilitate this through making tools, communicating with trees, mountains, the sea and the unseen. When working with trees, the communication happens throughout the process of gathering the materials, making of the tool and the use of the tool. The tool embedded en enables that communication process to be manifest as visible to others a translation of the message from trees to humanity. All three actions, the gathering, making, and use of the tools are an aspect of the documentation process. I would imagine it has um, parallels with Natasha's drums in some way as well. And Earth Song, going into the project Earth Song now. Earth Song is a solo body of work that is embodied is the embodiment of me as Gaia. It is an intentional, sorry, it is an internal to external experience, the microcosm to the macrocosm. Earth Song is also a feeling, a feeling that I get within, and a sound that connects me to the natural environment and to the hidden aspects of the wider world. 
At the end, I'll um, play a very short film that's entitled Earth Song that this image is taken from, and you'll hear my Earth Song. It is conversations with others, with trees, with the land and with the ancestors, documented in sound, words and images as I'm returning home to myself, at peace with myself and my embedded environment. It is an expression of what is deep within my soul. The work that is emerging is in the form of multi-sensory mapped self-portraits, film and sensory responsive playful sculpture. Earth song is pure song expression. I've got about five minutes. Okay, we're almost there. Cathedral of the Trees is a socially engaged project with a focus on the experience and manifestation of peace. It's the embodiment of social and environmental change. And in contrast to Earth song, it is the expression of the external to the internal or macrocosm to the microcosm. Both projects meet and overlap and could be seen as two polarities of the same thing. It exists in the physical, the imaginary and the liminal space in between, um, the space in between or the ma. It encompasses the seen and the unseen and encourages participants to consider the concept and reality of peace from a personal community and global point of view and how it may be manifest in our lives and wider environment. The premise of Cathedral of the Trees is that it's a metaphor and ultimately a physical pilgrimage of the body and mind, exploring what peace is both personally, internally, as well as the world, as well as um, on a world and planetary scale. I was very grateful to be awarded seed funding from Utopia's Bach to kickstart start some of the test ideas for Cathedral of the Trees. The funding will pay for three artists' um, micro residences. I'm also planning for the first Cathedral of the Trees event titled The Blueprint of Peace, explored through the Mar. And this event will take place on Zoom and be open to anybody. Um, as mentioned earlier, Earth Song and Cathedral of the Trees are projects that meet and overlap, but ultimately join again to embody oneness. They are facilitating change both within the artist and the wider world through diverse communication with others, humans and the natural world as a whole. Um, this happens by working with the liminal or with the ma, both physically and virtually to create a greater level of understanding and integration, acknowledging that we are just one part of the great whole rather than metaphorically the top of the food chain. Within the Ma, wonderful, magical things can happen. And there we are. That is me. Would you prefer me to share the link for the video so people can watch in their own time. It's two yeah. and a half minutes. I think I that's a good that. idea. I've actually just shared it. Uh, on the oh, chat. wonderful. That's great. Um, that's great. I thought maybe we might run out of time. So um, that's fine. I'll put the link in the chat. Um, but I would like to invite anyone to come in and ask a question. I'll make a comment. There's, there's lots of comments um, being added about uh, the the, the extraordinary, um, almost uh, serendipitous connection between today's presentations. I wish I could take credit. It's a brilliant programmer, but it's not really the way that First Friday works. So um, uh, anyone would like to come in and ask a question or make a comment? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I, wondered, um, I wondered if you could say a bit more about that um, that process that you talked about of, um, of, of, of making a tool and, and um, it, 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 you know, the, the relationship with the source of that material and then how that plays through that process. Yeah, I, um, 
I create a space where I can, I call it slipping into the ma. It's a meditative state. It's likely to be a similar state to um, how Natasha was speaking about when she's communicating with other within the land and with the drums. Um, I create that state through a sensory process, either through singing my earth song or indeed weaving um, or spinning. Um, repetitive movement works for me um, because it's a sensory practice that I use for calming um, as somebody who is autistic. So once I'm in that state, I can connect to the vibration of the, of the plant, um, the tree, the mountain, the water, and um, literally have um, a conversation um, where information is imparted to me and I ask questions and communicate as well. Um, at some sometimes I ask if I can take a small piece. So I may take a stone or I may ask if I can take a small piece of wood. And if the answer is yes, I will. Um, and um, then proceed to make intuitively what I need to make. Um, I then leave that tool aside but when I come back to it, it allows me direct connection to where um, the material came from. And when I slip back into the ma, I then produce work, which is a response collaborating with either the tree or the stone or whatever it is that I was working with. So I hope that helps a little bit. Thank you. That was great. Yes, That's great. I think we we should um, draw things to a close, but I, I think one of the things that I think has been very common about today is also this notion of flow and this uh, this idea of going into uh, another space, whether it's through usually it's through forms of repetition, whether that's drumming or uh, whether it's going and taking yourself into a ma. Um, or even, in fact, digging in the soil. I think all of these things are allow us to, I think as artists, we almost need to be in that space uh, before we can make. Um, but it's just my uh, opinion, but it's certainly true for me. However, I'm going to say goodbye. It's, um, it's always that time when we've gone a bit past two o'clock and people are leaving um, um, because it's the end of lunchtime. But thank you, everybody. Particularly thanks to Jude and Natasha and Gaia for contributions today. Uh, we will put this up on the website quite soon. Uh, and do come back to us next month. I know that uh, we've got cats in that one as well. And we've got, uh, what else was the common thing? I can't remember now. Um, but um, uh, next month is still forming. So uh, they've still got a vacancy. So if you'd like to come in and share next month please do let me know okay i'm going to say goodbye uh and thank you for being with us and we'll see you next time okay bye-bye thank you richard bye